So given that life is a solution to a chemistry problem, if we re-ran Earth a million times, how different would the results be? If we look at that wheel, how different would be the, the tree of life, do you think? Like, what's your gut say? My uh, mind asks, uh, are you imagining, if, if we're repeating the planet one million times, are we seeing, um, are the things that happened, I'm not talking at the chemical level, but at the environment level, did, do they happen at the same time, at the same frequency, at the same intensity, every time you're running this tape over and over again? Yes, you mean like geological stuff? Yeah, like so. Are, is the so same... you're saying those are important? I mean, that's that's in, yep. the fact that you would ask that question is also fascinating. So that's important. The, the, I... the timing, the frequency, the intensity of geological. Yeah. Events. So when when we run this imaginary rewind and replay experiments in our minds, I want to know whether we are positioning all the same geologic events at the same chronological order as well, or whether we are also giving them more randomness. So if the volcano erupted, is it happening at the same time? If if you have a, are dinosaurs getting wiped off every time with the same meteorite that's hitting the same? But also like temperature changes temperature and all that. Temperature changes kind of everything. That's actually I've heard you say somewhere that one of the things that's fascinating to you about this whole process of evolution is that the the mem the memory the the process of evolution the, all the mechanisms were invented and developed despite all the variation geologically through the hardship that Earth has gone through. That the, the biological innovations persisted despite persisted, that? Persisted, yeah, yeah, despite that, which is which is interesting. You yeah. kind of think of the biological innovations kind of happening on their own. Because we, so we uh, actually have a center exploring this problem. Uh, we want to understand whether, it's almost like judging a book by its cover, right? Do you just look at an environment and then see whatever is present or scarce in that environment, and then think that, okay, the life form that will exist in this environment will obviously have a lot of molybdenum in its system. Look at all this molybdenum around here. Mm -hmm. Or will it be, uh, because if you say that, you are now putting the environment in, in, in the more prime driver role, right? That you're saying that environment will determine what biology will or will not use. Um, but, We've done studies that show that it's not necessarily this straightforward. That, for instance, we looked at going back to nitrogen. Uh, one thing that's fascinating about the way cells fix nitrogen, uh, the ones that can do, uh, is that uh, they also do this through a lot of help of a lot of metals, a lot of elemental support, really. And um, it, which geologists use to understand where did this metabolism even evolved, where, at first place. So we look at ancient oceans, we try to understand the elemental composition of ancient oceans, and what we see is that in some cases, the metabolisms, even though they prefer a certain metal or an element that is in the environment, that metal wasn't abundant in the environment, but still, life chose that. So it's not that straightforward as though whatever you you are you are what you eat but you don't necessarily eat what is obvious to you. And just because there's a lot of that food around you doesn't mean life will ultimately go there. Maybe most of the time it will. But it seems like in the case of nitrogen fixation it didn't and maybe that made the difference. It's so cool that uh right it's not the abundant resource that's going to be the definition of what kind of life flourishes. So so it's not it's not a straightforward thing. Yes, but your sense is that the different timing of the different conditions of the environment would change the way evolution happens. Yeah, for instance, I mean, there, there, I think it's in the 80s, maybe earlier than that, the Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life, uh, which changed, I think, a lot of scientists' uh, life, including mine. Um, he contemplates on this uh, notion of the tape of life, of course, I hope people still know what tape is, but I think your listeners will know what tape is. I don't know. <laughs> it's the um, tape? tape. Go on, tell me about the <laughs> tape. tape? Is, that, is that like a TikTok? Do you, can you swipe on it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I apologize or for my he, rude interruption. <laughs> I can't ask for it. But <laughs> he he speculated or he suggested this hypothetical experiment whether 
if life was recorded on or can be imagined to be recorded on a linear uh, is a linear chain of events recorded on a tape and if we were to rewind the tape would be listen to the same song right so this was and in his proposition i also thought um yeah but are we replaying the tape in the same exact manner or are we meaning all the geological and environmental events, are they happening at the same time? Because then you removed the randomness from equation a little bit, right? You just removed it because you're assuming everything will happen at the same time, at the same intensity. So that's not too contingent. Um, that means that the natural selection you're thinking is really operating at more, or or evolution uh, is operating at more under more random forces uh, than that can be dictated by the environment. So in our way of understanding or thinking about rewinding, replaying, I don't think we're thinking about the role of the environment as clearly or don't seem to be integrated as much. But I, I also wonder if it's possible that the chemistry ultimately defines the destination, that um, despite all the environmental changes, despite all the randomness, we'll, yes, end, but we'll that, end up in something. But, but we are not talking about whether life will emerge and sustain itself. We are talking about whether life will emerge and sustain itself in the shape and form that is similar to what we have right now. So uh, you are chemistry, I'm chemistry. We're having this conversation and your plants are chemistry too. They are also having their own conversation. These <laughs> plants are fake, but yes. I knew but that. I didn't chemistry. want to say that, but they, they're fake. But, what do, you, uh, what do, you, do you look at my place? Of course they would be fake. Otherwise they would die. What's All wrong with this place? It's uh, it's wonderful. It's it's I'm we're I'm Alice and this is Wonderland. This this is great. I, this is great. It's just that you know there's this is a place where robots flourish and this is th that those plants are fake. Are you saying that you and I are the only living organisms? Well, obviously there are microbes in this room, but yeah, um, yeah, we so are that, the yeah, only so, living organisms. I was no. thinking of getting a dog. Well, you you, you don't, this is not a clean room, so you you have microbes here. Yes, many millions. Yes. So so you and I and all the microbes in this room, we are chemical systems that are operating in a way that we can respond and sense and our environments and whatnot. Yeah. But in if you are asking if we are going to be here, then you're imagining that another solution is also possible, which is different than the fundamentals of life. Because life will do always, life will do its life thing. Mm -hmm. I guess it goes all the way back to the things we're talking about translation and the stuff you were messing with is figuring out what is the important stuff and what isn't. It makes me wonder about, you know, just like with the trans, uh, translation uh, machinery with human beings, I wonder what's the important stuff. Is it important to have two limbs? Is it important to have eyes? Like it was obvious that the sensory mechanism of eyes, like sight, were to develop. How many times if we were on Earth would the sensory mechanism of sight develop? And what would it look like? Would it be one giant eye? Or would it be two? What's with the symmetry? Why are we so damn symmetrical? In, in response to Steve Jay Gold's proposition, yes. uh, most people who would who argue that uh, life is convergent and it will in fact lead to a few determined outcomes or, the, or it's not that the outcome is determined per se, but uh, it's the pathways are restricted and the mutational trajectories that life can act upon uh, are already very limited so that the final outcomes are a few and eyes being one of them. So, uh, the, con the convergence at the eye level was suggested as an example, was presented as an example of why life may actually embark on the same solution over and over again, given that many species evolved it independently from one another. Do you think there's any inkling of truth to that? Like, uh, is it just us humans thinking we're special? I think the those innovations came again so far after the... Uh, <laughs> the I know the it's, it's the, the fun stuff. Yes, uh, because it's it's. Thank you. I mean, th th thank you. I like, we humans tend to talk about the later stuff, but without the earlier yeah. stuff. Yeah. So when we, we when we think stuff. of earlier, there's, and I, I ask this to my students too. I want them to close their eyes and think about just nothingness but dust. We we're, we're, we don't have trees. We don't have plants. When we say an empty place, or visually at least, to we are talking about a planet that is really alien. So understanding our own past is similar to understanding an alien planet altogether. Given that it is a very different planet that did not have any oxygen for two billion years, 
we there's nothing that is familiar to us that we would even think about with, when we think about life that is present in our past. Yet here we are. So cool that from that came this, like houses and people. And, and we are very, very, we are the super late arrivals to the party, right? So th this is definitely not our planet. It's the microbial planet that we live in. But the potential to create us was always there. Like How do you know that? Because we were created. Oh, I don't know. I what is, it? is it, you think it's possible that it's, even for the early stuff? Oh yeah, maybe if it's super unlikely, yeah, that we just got super. Oh, this is the planet that got really lucky given the chemistry. Like maybe if, to create the bacteria is not so lucky, but to create complex organisms all the way up to mammals, that's super lucky. Yes, maybe. and it may all come down to a few innovations that happened at the molecular level. Um, that may or may not be inevitable. Uh, that that the, the, so all all these molecular tricks may have enabled the the sort of mere existence of whatever you are able to define as familiar to yourself. And you have a hope that science can answer this these questions to reconstruct. Science is answering these questions. I mean, it we are limited to going uh, back to the beginning in our ways. Right, so we rely on biology. It is overwritten. You're talking about four, four billion year old records that is ever changing. That again makes it beautiful, but also makes it difficult. It's not tractable. Geology has uh, to some degree. To some degree, it has a record uh, of a more static, frozen state record that is embedded on itself on the surface of this planet, if we can find them. And that's the key, that most of these um, recorded um, remnants are, if we are lucky, we find them. They are not naturally selected. They are, the, they are found, they need to be found for us to read them. So we work with a very handful set of samples, especially when we talk about the deep past, the planet with no oxygen when we pass the great oxidation event threshold that is about 2.5 billion years. So the earliest life is even harder. You are trying to write the story of life based on a handful of rocks and what is recorded on them.